Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 32 years we have invited voices of conscience to explore the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. Learn more about the forum online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. My name is Nathan Dungan. I am founder and president of Share, Save, Spend and the guest moderator of the forum. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Anna LaPay leads the Real Food Media Project, a collaborative movement working for sustainable food and farming across the U.S. In partnership with her mother, Frances Moore LaPay, she co-founded the Small Planet Institute, which is committed to researching and providing education on the root causes of hunger and poverty around the globe. She is the author or co-author of three books, including the 2010 publication, Diet for a Hot Planet, The Climate Crisis at the End of Your Fork. A graduate of Brown University, she holds an MA in Economic and Political Development from Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs. In her presentation today, Building Real Food Communities, she will explore the economic, environmental, and social costs of industrial food and farming and offer creative solutions to fostering a just and sustainable food system. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Anna LaPay. I wake up one morning absolutely panicked. It's my first semester in college and I've just missed my alarm clock. I jump out of bed, I throw on my clothes, I run out of my dorm room door, down the hall, across campus, dashing as fast as I can, and I get to the lecture hall right as class is beginning. So I heave a big sigh of relief, I pull out my notebook, and I get ready to focus. And I notice at that point that the person standing at the front of the room isn't my professor, but a guest lecturer. And I think, huh, I didn't, I didn't notice that from the syllabus. And I start listening to the lecture, and she's really, really, really off topic. But I think, you know, maybe she wasn't fully briefed on what we're studying in this class, and I give her the benefit of the doubt. And as I'm taking notes, I realize that on the chalkboard behind her, there's all of these notes from a history class that I think the teaching assistants in our class have gotten so lazy they didn't even bother to erase the notes on the board. But okay, you know, maybe they were just too busy. And after a few more minutes go by, the teaching assistants stop the class to pass out course evaluations. And I look for my TA kind of ready to say hi. I don't see her anywhere, but I think, oh, well, maybe she's just out sick that day. And, you know, or it's a big class. Maybe she's up in the front. I don't see her. So they hand out the course evaluations. And I notice at the top of the course evaluations, it says European History 101, which I promptly cross out and write Anthropology 50 and think again about these lazy TAs that didn't even print their own course evaluation forms. And then I proceed to fill out the entire form. I was trying to be very constructive in my criticism, and I, I turned this form in to the nearest TA. At which point, a friend of mine sitting two rows up turns around and says, Anna, I didn't know you were in my history class. So I don't know if any of you have ever had this experience. <laughs> Maybe you have, of having facts hitting you right in the face, and yet you figure out a way to make sense of them. I was so sure that I was in the right class that despite all the, uh, in retrospect, obvious evidence that I certainly was not, I didn't see any of it. So why is it that? Why, why do we do that? Well, cognitive scientists have found that one of the ways that we human beings can have found to make sense of the world, we are bombarded with so much information every single day that one of the ways that we handle that is to create 
these frames in our mind, what the Swiss psychologist Jean Piaget talked about as schemas, sort of orienting principles and ways of making sense of the world. And in a way, it's, it's ingenious, it's handy, it's very smart to do that because we need to when you think about all the information that comes at us. But what can happen with those schema in our mind is they can be so powerful and so dominant that we will ignore the facts before we toss out the frame, if the facts don't fit our frame. And so I'm here today to, to talk about how we build real food communities. How is it that we can create communities where everyone is fed, where the food that we grow is good for our bodies and good for the farmers and good for the planet? And I'm going to suggest that one of the ways that we do that requires that we, we focus and talk about how we think about the world. And what are the dominant schemas that we hold in our mind about food and farming? And what I want to suggest is that one of those most dominant schemas about food and farming that many of us hold is actually blocking us from seeing those facts right in front of us. It's blocking us from seeing a crisis, and it's also blocking us from seeing incredible possibility. So what is one of these dominant schemas that, that's, doing, that's doing this to our minds? It's that industrial agriculture is, is the best and the only way to feed all of us, and especially on a planet with a growing population. So what do I mean by industrial agriculture? It's a type of system dependent on chemical herbicides and insecticides and other pesticides, a system that's dependent on synthetic fertilizer to get soil fertility, energy-intensive irrigation, and when it comes to livestock, confining animals into, uh, into uh, factory farms or confined animal feeding operations. So the second half of this conviction, so that's the first part, that industrial ag is sort of the only way we're going to produce enough. The second half of this conviction is that sustainably grown foods, local foods, it might sound really nice. I mean, who, who among us doesn't like to stroll through a farmer's market or eat a just-picked heirloom tomato? But that, that that way of farming isn't practical. It's not going to be able to, to, to really deliver on what we need in terms of production. That's kind of the other half of this dominant schema. Now, the word sustainable, I know, has, uh, uh, get gets tossed around a lot. In fact, I was just reading an advertising age magazine, the magazine for, for the marketers out there, that they declared last year that sustainable is the jargoniest jargon. And so let me take a minute to de-jargon it a little bit. Uh, so by sustainable farming, what I mean is a set of principles that places the farm inside of an ecosystem, understands that a farm operates in an ecosystem. And it means implementing principles into the farming practice, like building soil fertility with natural methods, like planting nitrogen-fixing legumes and using compost and manure, not synthetic fertilizer. It means principles like dealing with unwanted pests and plants with natural methods, not toxic chemicals. It means doing things like integrating animals back onto the farm and having them eat what they, uh, nature intended them to eat, not a diet filled with drugs and antibiotics and, and artificial growth hormones. Now, for the past 12 years, I have been seeking to understand the potential of this way of farming of these sustainable principles. And to do that, I've traveled to farms all around the world, from Poland, Brazil, Bangladesh, India, and to many states across this country, uh, including right here in Minnesota. And it's also, this, this, these questions have also drawn me to peer-reviewed studies and research reports from all around the world. And as I've been doing that research, I've also been following how the media talks about sustainable farming and how, it, how that dominant frame is getting created in, in the media that we all consume. And I've noticed this really big disconnect from what I've been seeing on the ground and what I've been hearing in the media. That often in the media, sustainable farming is described as this sort of quaint idea Again, nice to go to the farmer's market, but not practical. Sort of suited only really for those, that type of consumer who really likes to buy expensive kale at Whole Foods markets. Uh, but again, sort of not practical. 
And I could get into a little bit more in the Q&A about how we're hearing these messages in the media, but for now, what I want to do is dive into what are the facts on the ground, right? What do you hear and see when you talk to sustainable farmers around the world and tap into this incredible body of research that's emerged in the past decade? Because what I want to suggest is that when you do that, when you listen to those facts, what you hear is an incredibly good news story about sustainable farming. What if I were to tell you that there is a new technology in agriculture, one that yields as much and sometimes even more than industrial agriculture methods, and at the same time reduces chemical pesticide use by 97%, reduces energy and fossil fuel use by up to 55%, and sends biodiversity measurements and soil fertility measurements off the charts. That would be pretty exciting, right? You might say, well, that technology sounds great. Where do we get it? How do we buy it? That technology exists. It's called sustainable farming. And in an incredible study that came out recently by researchers in Europe, they documented exactly that, exactly those results from sustainable practices on the farm. And what if I were to tell you that researchers evaluating agriculture programs across the entire continent of Africa discovered that the relatively inexpensive practices of sustainable farming were making a huge difference for farmers who started integrating those principles onto their farm, increasing yields and improving incomes dramatically. Improving incomes because think about it, those sustainable principles I mentioned are principles that anyone with the education and training can implement. You don't have to buy seeds, you don't have to buy chemicals, you don't have to buy fertilizer. So it's in a, in a way, it's a very liberating way of farming for cash poor farmers around the world. It's the kinds of good news evidence that uh, came out in probably one of the most important reports about food that no one's ever heard about, <laughs> called the ISTAD report. Maybe some of you have. Uh, when I ask audiences, if anyone in this, audiences in this country, if anyone's heard of this report, I rarely get a hand, one hand up. The report is, uh, it's a bit of a mouthful. The full name is the International Assessment of Agricultural Knowledge, Science, and Technology for Development. Uh, you can remember it as the ISTAD report. And what this assessment involved was research by 400 experts from all around the world who looked at the best practices in agriculture all around the world over four and a half years. It was a report commissioned by the World Bank and the United Nations. And what did this body of experts discover? They discovered similar things to what I've already mentioned. They discovered that sustainable farming is an incredibly effective way to deliver on yields without requiring farmers spend so much money on inputs. They discovered, in fact, their consensus was that we must, if we truly are to feed the world in the future, we must move in this direction of, support, of supporting sustainable farming. So in addition to all this incredible good news that I've been discovering and this body of research that's growing, what I've also come across are the really powerful facts about what are the real costs of this industrial model of agriculture. That same ISTAD report found that while industrial agriculture can increase crop yields, that if you look holistically at what this does to farming communities and to rural economies and to people's health, they found that it does so at an incredible cost to public health, the environment, social equality, women's rights, and the very basis of food security. In fact, what we're finding is that this model of industrial agriculture is actually undermining the very natural resources that we are going to need to feed the future. And let me explain what I mean by that. There are lots of examples of how this is happening, and there are three that I think are the most important. One, soil. So across the United States, industrial farms cause erosion and degradation much faster than topsoil can be rebuilt and replaced. In fact, a new report from Environmental Working Group last year found that some parts of our heartland are losing 64 tons of topsoil per acre every single year. No soil, no food, right? 
to water, another kind of key part of farming, right? Uh, what we're finding is that industri the industrial model that's so heavily reliant on water is draining one of the most important aquifers in this country at a rate so fast that if we continue along this path, within 30 years, that aquifer will be empty, empty. And I like to think about an aquifer as sort of like fossil water, right? Once you deplete that aquifer, for all intents and purposes, that water is gone for our use. No water, no food. Three, climate. So the food system, when you look at it holistically, contributes directly and indirectly to nearly one-third of all greenhouse gas emissions that are driving the climate crisis. And I write about this in my most recent book. And when you think about that number, that's huge. That's, that's so important to be wrapping our heads around how do we reduce the food system's impact on the climate. Because you don't have to tell, you don't have to tell a farmer who was hit by record droughts last year that a stable climate is key to a healthy farm. Climate instability, fewer crops. So this is powerful stuff, I think. So why don't more of us believe that the industrial path is leading us in a way that is, uh, to use a jargony word, unsustainable? You know, why don't more of us believe in the potential of sustainable food systems? Remember, our frames can be so powerful that we'll dismiss the facts before we toss the frame. Now, this isn't to say that facts are not important. It is simply to say that facts aren't enough. So how do we change our frame? How do we do what Jean Piaget called accommodate? How do we do that really, really hard work? Scientists have found that one of the most effective ways to change our frame are through moments of cognitive dissonance. So what is cognitive dissonance? It's that moment you experience, that inescapable contradiction between what you think you know, what your frame might be telling you, and what reality is telling you. So back in that college lecture hall, I had my moment of cognitive dissonance when my friend, if he rose up, informed me I was in the wrong class. I had to shed my frame and shed it pretty fast. In my travels, I've had many of these moments of cognitive dissonance, of what I think, I've, uh, what I think about food, what I thought I knew about food, and what I have been forced to understand by seeing that reality in my face. And I have talked to farmer after farmer after farmer who has shared with me their moments of cognitive dissonance with how they farmed. And in, in the case of the farmers that I've met, one of the most common moments of cognitive dissonance has been those moments where a farmer has realized that the chemical pesticides that they've been using on their industrial farm has been the cause of an illness or cancer for themselves, their husbands, their wives, their children, and it has forced them to ask, isn't there another way? What's fascinating about the power of these moments of cognitive dissonance is also the research and understanding that we don't have to experience these moments ourselves, that we can experience them virtually through the power of story, through hearing the stories of those farmers who've made those transitions, through hearing the stories uh, like, uh, I'll, I'll share with you one of my favorite uh, moments of cognitive dissonance for myself, one of my favorite stories of farmers who are really showing us a different path. So it was the summer of 2008. Some of you may remember this summer, the Midwest had been hit by record floods. And I was in the state of Wisconsin right after the flooding, and the state was looking at millions of dollars of, uh, of, of recovery funds, for, especially for the farmers in that state. And I was traveling to, to visit a sustainable farmer named Mark Shepard. As I was driving to his farm, I passed field after field that looked like a lake because it was still completely underwater. So by the time I got to Mark's farm, I had a huge knot in my stomach. I was expecting to talk to a devastated farmer. 
When I pulled into his farm up this dirt driveway, I pulled in right at the moment where Mark and one of his farm interns were lounging on the porch of his solar-powered cider mill with grins from ear to ear. These were not the faces of devastated farmers. So I was eager to know, you know how was Mark's fate different from the farmers I could see across the road who had gullies torn out of their fields from the powerful rain? And that day, what he showed me is he showed me sustainable principles at work. And what he showed me is when you implement those sustainable principles, what you create is a farm with healthy soil, and healthy soil acts like an incredible sponge that's able to absorb all that water. What you create is a farm that has incredible biodiversity, so that, yes, his bell peppers did pretty badly, but they were only a small part of the farm, and the rest of his farm was doing great. And what you see is that kind of farm that, frankly, we are going to need in the future when that flooding that hit us in 2008 no longer becomes a freak once in a hundred years flood, but becomes an every year flood. And so I left Mark's farm that day, realizing what I saw on his farm was the face of the kinds of farms we need for the future. So this might leave you asking, well then, why aren't there a million marks out there if this is working so great? In part, I believe the reason is that we still are trapped in this dominant schema about food and farming, and that trap is affecting everything from what programs exist to support Mark and farmers who want to be like Mark, uh, everything from uh, the kinds of banks that will and won't loan to farmers like Mark who want to do the kinds of sustainable innovations that he's doing. So as a result, Farmers like Mark don't get what they need to thrive and grow and, and even to start their farms. When a young farmer wants to learn about integrating sustainable principles, there are only a handful of schools that will teach them, and a relatively small number of farmer training programs, like the one I was just learning about yesterday, run locally here by the Land Stewardship Project. When a team wants to investigate the benefits of sustainable principles, there's less than 5% of federal research dollars set aside for studying how to integrate sustainable principles on the farm. When a sustainable rancher wants to grow their business and process their livestock, there are only a few slaughterhouses left in many states that can handle their products. And in some states, like Montana, where I just visited, there is not a single one. Education, research, infrastructure, these are just three of the ways that the playing field for farmers doesn't make it easy for the marks of this country to launch their farms and thrive and grow. Now, I am suggesting that changing all of this means serious paradigm-shifting work. Now, does it seem impossible to some of you that we can do that? I would suggest that we as a society have changed our paradigms before, we do it all the time. So like some of you possibly, I've been watching a lot of episodes of Mad Men lately on television. And if you have too, you might know exactly what I'm talking about. You watch Mad Men and everyone smokes. And when I mean, when I say everyone, I mean everyone. Pregnant women smoke. New mothers smoke in the nurseries with their babies. Executives smoke in their offices, in their lobbies, in their elevators. I mean, not too long ago, smoking was seen as cool, it was seen as innocuous. In fact, my grandmother's doctor even advised her to start smoking to help her relax. <laughs> and my uncle, when he was a resident in, uh, uh, in his hospital, he was considered absolutely crazy for suggesting that maybe cigarette vending machines shouldn't be inside the hospital. And I remember in my lifetime having to be sure whenever I bought an airplane ticket that I checked the box that said I'd like to be in the no smoking section because there used to be a smoking section inside airplanes. Right? It's, it's crazy now to think about that. That paradigm shifted, and it shifted big time. Now, this shift didn't happen easily, of course. It didn't happen overnight. And remember, it didn't happen until decades after we had the scientific facts about smoking. 
But eventually, enough facts piled up, enough stories were told, enough of us had those moments of cognitive dissonance, and enough pressure was put to change policy. So I'm not saying that we'll make this paradigm shift about food overnight. But I know, because I've seen it with my own eyes, that this shift is already happening all across the planet, from leaders in the Buddhist nation of, Nutan, of Bhutan who've just declared that they want their country to be the first 100% organic food country on the planet, to the Department of the Environment in Ethiopia that's launching incredible farmer-to-farmer -farmer training programs to bring sustainable principles across the country. I've seen it in our country. I've seen this consciousness, consciousness shift happening in every single one of the 7,864 communities that now have a farmer's market in them. I've seen it on, in the hundreds of schools and every single state in the nation that now connect with food from local farmers. I've seen it on 290 college campuses that now have students organizing to bring sustainable food into their cafeterias. It's happening everywhere. And so I believe, seeing all of this happening, that there is incredible hope. There's incredible hope that we are making this shift and we all can be part of it. And that moving toward sustainability moving toward those real food communities where all of us have access to food that's nourishing for our bodies and nourishing for the planet, that it begins in our minds. It starts with how we think, and I'm here to tell you, it's already begun. Thank you. Thank you, Anna LaPay. You are listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on the Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. Learn more about the forum online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. I'm Nathan Dungan, the guest moderator of today's forum. Our speaker is sustainable food and farming activist Anna LaPay. We'll be taking questions for our speaker from the radio audience through Twitter and Facebook. Our Twitter handle is Westminster THF, and you can find us on Facebook at Westminster Town Hall Forum. While the ushers collect the questions from the in-house audience, I want to thank the co-sponsor of today's program, Minnesota Food Share, whose annual March campaign raises more than half the food that will be distributed this year by Minnesota Food Shelves. To learn more about Minnesota Food Share, visit their website, minnesotafoodshare.org. We invite the radio audience to join us at Westminster for our next forum on Thursday, April 18th at noon, when President and CEO of the Nature Conservancy, Mark Tursek, will be our guest speaker. Ms. LePay, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. I feel bad for our radio audience that they can't see how beautiful it is in here. Isn't it beautiful? Yes. So if the um, political leadership is currently lacking on the issue of climate change, what types of action do you suggest that employees in businesses, students in schools, residents in neighborhoods, citizens in municipalities, and others might take right now to address climate change and the food crisis? I love starting off with those really easy questions <laughs> with quick answers. So, I mean, we could, we could spend all day talking about the ways people can connect, because what is exciting about this moment is while we all might be very frustrated that we're not seeing more change at the international level in terms of really bold action on greenhouse gas emissions reductions, really bold action on climate change, there is a lot happening in communities across this country. And as I mentioned in my talk, there is this very big connection between climate change and food. There's the connection of how much our food system currently contributes to climate change and how do 
we support sustainable farmers that are reducing those on-farm emissions and food system emissions. But there's also what I also talked about in, the, in, in, in my lecture about the importance of supporting our sustainable farmers because they are going to be the resilient farms that are going to be providing us the food we need in the future in that climate unstable future. So the question was, what can we do? And uh, depending on where you are and where you sit, whether it is in business or whether it's a student in a university or in a local government, there is so much you can do. Uh, and I think first and foremost, the thing that we can do is get people to realize that to change our food system, it's going to take a lot more than just shopping differently. That we really need to look at what are the policies at the local level, at the state level, and the federal level that are going to make it possible for a million marks to emerge, for a million sustainable farmers to, to emerge and be supported. And, and so that's where I think the energy needs to be. And I'll just point out one really positive example, I think, of this happening on college campuses, for those of you who are either administrators or professors or students, there's an incredible new movement, just a few years old, called Real Food Challenge, of young people working with their colleges to try to bring more sustainable food purchasing through their schools. And their goal is 20% real food by 2020. And on some campuses, they've already exceeded that goal. As I mentioned, there are 290 campuses now that have some organizing around this cause. And it is really exciting to see it happen. And we were already starting to see, as I mentioned, some really incredible impacts. So uh, you mentioned policy, um, Anna. So what then are the most important policy discussions and, and really issues that can help shift our agriculture toward uh, agricultural system, excuse me, toward sustainability. Well, there's a, a little a little policy some of you might have heard of called the Farm Bill, <laughs> and uh, it's uh, every five years we renegotiate and deliberate on what this bill. Uh, says and does, and where uh, the lion's share of our public money, our taxpayer dollars, go into the food system. And we're in this very peculiar political fight right now around this farm bill. It was supposed to be uh, tied up in a bow and, and passed last year, and that has not happened. And so there's still a lot of debate and policy organizing around this farm bill. And what I, I think a lot of people don't understand that the farm bill has impacts across the food system. So it's not just a bill that sets policy for farmers, but it's also what sets policy for our nutrition assistance programs. And we, uh, as advocates, are really trying hard to protect those nutrition assistance programs in uh, uh, a, mom a historical moment where we have uh, almost or more than 43 million Americans now needing nutrition assistance. And also trying to talk about farm bill farming policy to emphasize the importance of sustainability. And so one of the biggest fights in the farm bill policy right now is that the current bill, as it stands, has a program for crop insurance for farmers. And the crop insurance program, as, as one of my colleagues puts it, is essentially a revenue guaranteeing program for the insurance industry. That it requires nothing of farmers in terms of being sure that they're conserving their water, or conserving their soil, or taking measures to ensure that they are protecting their farmland, but it guarantees, uh, it guarantees essentially their income. Now, advocates who are critical of crop insurance are are incredibly supportive of farmers and understand that farmers of all people uh, absolutely need that kind of safety net and that kind of insurance. But they say that you need to bundle that kind of insurance with a set of requirements that ensures that farmers are taking protective measures for their farm. Uh, one of the policy groups that's done a lot of work on this is based here. It's called the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. And they had a great analogy about this. They said the way that current crop insurance policy is written it's like guaranteeing homeowners fire insurance, but not requesting that they have a single fire extinguisher in their house, uh, not making sure that they don't have open flames going in their kitchen. Um, so it's, it's not, it's, so again, it's saying not that farmers shouldn't have that protection, but saying that with all of the policies that are in the Farm Bill, let's look at it through that sustainability lens and through a lens that's encouraging farmers to make the right steps to protect the land. So kind of continuing that thread then, so don't many ag colleges depend on research, right? Mm -hmm. And then, so this person asks, can you discuss the relationship of ag colleges to um, the whole sustainable farm movement? Mm -hmm. Well, one of, again, one of the really exciting trends that I'm seeing 
across the country are more and more universities and colleges getting interested in teaching sustainability principles. So a couple years ago, I was in Washington State where uh, they were the, a university in Washington State was just announcing their first master's program in organic agriculture. It was the first in the country at the time. There are growing number of farmer apprenticeship programs in colleges that are, again, teaching farmers these principles. And that, to me, is very encouraging because as my farmer friends like to tell me, another way you could define sustainable farming is knowledge-intensive farming. So if industrial agriculture is input-intensive, meaning you really need to buy those inputs, the fertilizers, the pesticides, you need to pay a lot for the water, you need to input a lot to get that high productivity. With sustainable farming, you need to think a lot. You need to understand ecologies. You need to understand your watershed. You need to understand so much about how your ecosystem works. And that requires education and training. And uh, I mentioned this land stewardship project program that's farmer to farmer teaching. So it doesn't just ha have to happen at the university level, that there are a growing number of these grassroots farmer to farmer teaching programs that are helping farmers learn these methods too. So this is a fairly common question, one for a couple from the audience, one from Facebook. Um, please comment on the pro production and consumption of meat regarding sustainability. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is a very important question. And as the daughter of Francis Moore LePay, who wrote uh, uh, what became a best-selling book, Diet for a Small Planet, 40 years ago, if you can believe it, uh, that was one of the first looks at what is the impact of intensive animal operations on the planet um, and was really critical of that way of, of raising livestock. Uh, you know, I have strong opinions about this. I mean, the, the, the message that I think is really important for us to understand, and by us I mean those of us in this room, those of us in this country, is that when you talk about sustainability, you're talking about not only what are the sustainable principles like that I mentioned on the farm, but you're also talking about what does sustainable consumption look like. And what you find in this country is that we are over-consuming meat and dairy uh, almost more than any other nation on the planet. And that nutritionists will tell you, if you look at what the average American consumes, we're consuming about twice as much protein as we need. And so we all, uh, some of us more than others, but we all could reduce overall the amount of meat and dairy we're consuming without a single impact on our health. Uh, there are, of course, many ways to get high-protein diets without relying on uh, meat and dairy. But to me, I think that that conversation about sustainable consumption goes hand-in-hand hand with the conversation about sustainable production. That no matter how little meat and dairy you're, we are consuming, if the way we are producing it is in confined animal feeding operations that are highly polluting, that are inhumane to the animals, uh, that you don't have a sustainable equation, so that it needs to be on both, uh, on both hands. I was uh, one of the most powerful studies I read recently was a study out of the EPA that found that the air quality outside of confined animal feeding operations or livestock factory farms was worse than in our most polluted cities. So again, we're talking about the meat and dairy conversation, I think always needs to marry the consumption part with the production part. Are there any companies leading the way in sustainable farming? Recognizable companies? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is a really good question. And, and I would say yes, there, there are. And one of the, the companies that I think is a great example of, uh, of, of, of true sustainability in all senses, including kind of ensuring economic sustainability for farmers, is a uh, farmer co-op called Organic Valley. I know there are many Organic Valley farmers in this state. Uh, it's now a national, a national co-op, and uh, thousands of farmers are part of it. And what Organic Valley does as a company is it, it really involves farmers in the decision making about what prices they want to set for the, the the milk and the meat and the produce that they're getting, and it really puts the farmers into the process. And when I've talked to Organic Valley farmers across this country, what I've heard is that because of having that connection to Organic Valley, that they're able to have stable prices for their product. They're not selling their product into a commodity market where you could work 
all year just as hard as you did the year before, and the commodity price might drop so far that you do worse than zero in your balance sheet at the end of the year. And so having the kinds of uh, 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 price, uh, price mechanisms that Organic Valley has and those guarantees, you're able to have farmers be able to invest in their farm to know how much they're going to get the next year. And the farmer that I mentioned in my speak, speech, Mark Shepard, He's an Organic Valley farmer, and he explained to me that one of the reasons why he is able to farm the way he does and to have that kind of biodiversity he has on his farm is that he sells his produce into the co-op, and they bundle a lot of farmers' products together to sell to really big buyers. So because of that, again, that infrastructure and that market mechanism, Mark is able to do the kinds of sustainability practices on his farm that make sense for for his land, it makes sense for his farm. From uh, one of the students in the crowd today, you stated that agriculture is responsible for one third of greenhouse gas emissions. Can you explain how? Is it machinery, livestock, transportation, kind of some combination of all of the above? Mm -hmm. Uh, again, one of those questions that it's hard to answer quickly, um, uh, and because I ended up writing a whole book about it. But uh, but in a, in a nutshell, if I were to kind of give you the cliffs. Cliff Note version of, of my book. Uh, what I would say is that uh, it is, it is really quickly. It is about uh, where we're farming, what we're farming, and how we are farming. So the where. One of the reasons why the food system is such a big impact on the climate is because agribusiness is expanding large commodity farming into some of the most precious and important rainforests on the planet. So. Palm oil now, probably most of you don't even realize you're eating it. Palm oil is in most of the processed foods in our supermarkets. Palm oil is now being produced uh, uh, in these large plantations in Malaysia and Indonesia on land that was formerly really, really carbon-rich peatland. And those plantations are directly causing those two countries, especially Malaysia to be in Indonesia, to be uh, among the highest greenhouse gas emitters in the world. And so so it's, it's the where, where we're farming, it's the what we're farming, that we're not growing the kinds of uh, biodiverse crops that are good for our bodies, we're growing monocultures that need a lot of the chemicals and need a lot of synthetic fertilizer, and it's the how. It's raising animals in confined feeding operations is incredibly energy intensive. Um, so it's, it's those pieces that are most important. When people hear about emissions and food, they tend to only think about transportation, I found, that, oh, it's because we're shipping food you know, across vast distances. But when you really get into it, you realize that it's more about these bigger decisions about uh, where we're growing our food, how we're growing it, and what we're growing. So what role uh, should food manufacturers play in the shif shifting of this paradigm? Mm -hmm. Mm, that's a great question, and and I think there is is a role, and there is also uh, in a way sort of not a role. Um, but the the is a role place is that we certainly uh, have already seen food man some food manufacturers understanding the importance of sustainability, thinking about how can they reduce their own carbon footprint. So I interviewed for my book uh, some folks at Stonyfield Farms, for instance. They make yogurt, and uh, and one of the things that they're very committed to is looking at their own carbon footprint and how can they reduce it from everything from thinking about the packaging they use to how their cows are being raised. And so there are things like that that, that uh, food manufacturers can do. But on the other hand, what I think we all need to remember is that the food that is truly best for us and the food that's truly best for the climate is actually the food that is the least manufactured. And so to the extent that we are going to move towards sustainability, we are all going to uh, uh, have to cook a lot more for ourselves and uh, work with a lot more whole foods again. And, and for most of us who learn about cooking again and who bring those practices back into our families, it's not some burden that, oh, oh no, I have to make a delicious salad again tonight. You know, it's, it's something that feels great when you get those skills again. So I think, yes, food manufacturers need to be looking at their own carbon footprint, but we, as food eaters also really need to be looking at a different whole sector of the supermarket and uh, looking at whole foods as a way to be bringing sustainability into our diets. 
So your mother, Frances Moore LePay, um, has been a significant thought leader in this space, obviously, for some time. To that end, she's probably had some impact on your thoughts and values around this topic. So as the parent of a young child, what would you say to other parents and grandparents about how they can influence attitudes, habits, and values of their children and or grandchildren? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old daughter, so I think about this a lot these days. And what I have discovered and uh, is that with my own children, that having exposed them from a very early age to, to the kind of food that I'm talking about today, that they have a really strong desire for it, that they are, knock on lots of wood, uh, they are eating a really good diet, they eat lots of fruits and lots of vegetables, and that I, as a parent, have so benefited from the kind of activism that I'm talking about. So I used to live, until a few months ago, in Brooklyn, New York, not exactly the place that you would necessarily think local foods are, are booming, and yet, because of the activism of a small group of New Yorkers starting about 20 years ago, we started bringing into the city programs called Community Supported Agriculture Programs, where you could become a member of a farm and get fresh food from a farm every week. And as a result, there are now dozens of these CSAs, almost 100 now actually, serving about 40,000 people in New York City. And that as a young mom, I was able to have my daughter's first tastes of raspberries and peaches and strawberries and uh, apples and pears and zucchini and tomatoes and corn and spinach and kale come from a farm that I knew and trusted and be the most delicious flavorful, flavorful fruits and vegetables possible. And that was her first exposure to food. So, then my message is that actually it is very easy to turn young people on to good food. Unfortunately, in our food environment, we as parents are, are, are challenged not by the desire of our children to eat this way, but by the fact that we operate in an environment where our children are bombarded with food marketing in so many ways beyond our control. The food industry is spending about $2 billion a year in marketing to children and teens, and many billions more in marketing they see anyway. So that while I might be doing it right at home, what's happening in her school, what's happening in her friends' homes, it's this bombardment of marketing and advertising. That again, I'm excited to say that there are many people saying that this is harmful practices and deceitful practices that children shouldn't be advertised to in this way. Many people have asked this question, Anna. Um, there's, by some estimates, uh, this person had said nearly 17 million kids who are in the U.S. who are food insecure. And um, so what are their options, you know, for people and families with limited financial resources? How do they participate in this shift, either having access to that, you know, quality food, or what role do they play in, in uh, this shift as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great question, and, and I was just listening to uh, an interview with uh, the director and a participant in a new film called A Place at the Table about hunger in America, and uh, they were saying that about one in four children, I think it is, uh, is, is hungry at some point in, um, in their young lives in this country, which is just really hard to, to wrap one's mind around. And, uh, and so what... What I think is another uh, area of this advocacy and of this work that, that gives me so much hope is seeing how people are working to figure out ways to improve access to good, healthy food for everyone, not just, as I mentioned, those folks who want to spend a lot on organic kale at Whole Foods. So the work that FoodShare is doing here uh, in Minneapolis and in the state. And uh, so thinking about how do we improve that access? How do we do things like uh, pilot programs where now people on food, on nutrition assistance, uh, using SNAP, uh, what used to be known as food stamps, can use SNAP at farmer's markets and piloting programs like they now have in New York and in Michigan and many other states where the states have stepped in and created incentive programs where in New York City, if you use your food stamps at a farmer's market for every $2 you spend, you can get $5 worth of produce. So it's incentivizing people to use their, uh, use their nutrition assistance on the food that is most nutritious to them. And we're also seeing all across the country 
local projects working with uh, people across the economic spectrum in teaching them how to grow food for themselves. And that's another area that I think is really exciting. We have time for one final question. Um, as someone who is relatively new to these um, issues, what other resources would you recommend to help build insight and awareness? Always a great question to end on. So uh, my latest project is called the Real Food Media Project, and we're creating a set of educational tools to help people, especially those people who are relatively new to these issues, understand them and get connected with groups working to make change. So that's at Real Food Media. Dot org, uh, But there are also just a lot of incredible resources on these issues. It's really an exciting time to be asking these questions. So documentary films like this recent one, A Place at the Table, that's in theaters now. You can download it on iTunes. Uh, there are uh, a lot of really incredible uh, books uh, and websites. And uh, we have a lot of those listed at our website. And I also know that there, wherever I have gone in this country, there has been local activism on these issues. And so if you are new to these issues, wherever you may find yourself, it, I promise you, uh, with just a little bit of searching and a little bit of asking, you can find folks in your community working on these issues and correct, co connecting directly to other people working in your community, I think is the number one way to understand how you can fit into making this paradigm shift and being part of this move towards sustainable food for everyone. Thank you, Anna LePay. Thank you.